So my role on the team, we, we create a lot of technical training courses, what we used to call speedways. Uh, you no, know, these are customer training courses, sometimes one to three day courses uh, for usually something Xilinx related. Uh, do a lot of reference designs for primarily Xilinx focused boards. Um, Pedal Linux BSPs is kind of my domain. Um, keeping them updated and posted online for our different uh, SOMs and development boards. Uh, I've done some development board development, like hardware development, but that was a few years ago. I haven't really done too much of that since. We have a new, a new group that does that, so I, do, I need to do less of it. Uh, in, ad in addition to the VSPs, I also dabble some in some Linux app development for writing like custom scripts or custom applications that we need to integrate into a BSP for whatever reason. So today here though, we're gonna talk about ultimately using Pink to accelerate functions that um, would run in software, can run in software, but run much faster in hardware. And we'll take a look at the stone age here of uh, back in the days when accelerating a function using a, a processor and a coprocessor. And this coprocessor was usually something very um, application or task specific. And it was always, a, uh, a, this is a two chip approach, right? So you, it was a separate chip on the board. And that added a lot of, at the board level, add a lot of design co co complexity because of all the extra wires. Um, you need to route on the board. At a chip level, had another layer of complexity because that interface between the processor and coprocessor sometimes proprietary. So you sometimes had to, um, assuming your coprocessor here is a FPGA, you had to have a custom piece of IP to handle that interface. Uh, it, but it also could be PCI or PCI Express. But these days, we can get rid of that two-chip approach and take advantage of putting the processor and our coprocessor, our accelerator, in the same device using the Zinc and Zinc and PSOC devices. And this is a very high-level uh, view of a Zinc and PSOC device where you've got a quad ARM Cortex A53 processor and dual R5 processing system with its custom set, I'm sorry, common set of peripherals um, d attached directly to the PS, and of course, memory controller for access to you know, DDR4 memory out on the board. But you've also got this high bandwidth link, lots of high AXI high bandwidth interfaces between the PS and the PL for adding more common peripherals that attach to the PS, but not directly. They go through the FPGA fabric. So if your PS configuration um, needs two ethernets, but you can only get one attached directly to the PS, you can route the other one out the PL fabric and out the FPGA fabric IOs. Uh, you can also add your custom peripherals in the FPGA fabric, right? That's what FPGA, F F F FPGA fabric is great for. And also custom coprocessors, custom accelerators. It's in and take advantage of the high bandwidth um, links there to solve that bandwidth problem. Because a lot of times in that two chip solution, you would find that these connections, this interface is often bandwidth limited, right? So it would often take longer to transfer data from the coprocessor back to the processor than it did actually do the computation um, on the coprocessor itself. So, Zinc and PSOC solves that, solves that problem. But being able to create that custom accelerator, that custom coprocessor in the PL invites its own set of um, challenges for you because it is completely custom, right? So we want to be able, we want a way to take advantage of that acceleration capability but also make it easy for us to use. And we want to, and, and Python is a way to do that. And so we have this 
uh, Xilinx has pink. It literally means Python on zinc. P for Python, Y and Q for zinc. Um, and it is an open source, of course, project owned by Xilinx. Um, to make it easy to design embedded systems with Zinc and Zinc and PSOC. And Python language and libraries uh, ex exploit run on both the PS and the PL. And we'll see how that works a little bit later. So this allows you to create high performance embedded applications from uh, parallel hardware execution to take advantage of that FPGA fabric, which is great at running parallel tasks, many tasks at the same time, um, high frame rate video processing, uh, hardware accelerated al algorithms like we'll see later with the neural network, um, high bandwidth I/O, and you know low latent, uh, low latency control. There's a whole lot more information here at this link that you'll all get these slides, so you don't have to write these links down. Just remember that they're here. And so what we see with pink is that we have our overlays, and more about, we'll talk more about them later, but we have our overlays that live in, in the PL, and they exist as a bitstream. And through the Linux kernel, we have Python that runs and interacts with those overlays. And on top of Python, we have our, our pink libraries that our pink notebooks interact with directly with our hardware with those overlays down in the PL. So it, what is an overlay? It's a, essentially, it's a Python wrapper around an underlying PL hardware design, right? So um, you have access to hardware, coprocessors and peripherals as function calls, right? Python function calls. So it's kind of analogous to uh, uh, custom hardware, I'm sorry, yeah, custom, customized software libraries. You treat it just as if it were a software library. So if for an image processing example that uses appeal for hardware acceleration, the software programmer developer uses a library to uh, run the image processing functions um, on the coprocessor, right, on the accelerator in the PL for doing anything from edge detection to, um, or so bell filtering to thresholding, whatever, whatever they need to do with that video stream. Um, hardware coprocessors are loaded into the PL dynamically as required and uh, just like a software library is loaded as required by whatever software application. So the, the PL is reconfigured as needed and these overlays can have one or more bit streams to do that. So in the, in, as, the, as the device is running, the PL is continually um, reconfigured as needed. Uh, right. Let me see what I'm forgetting here. It's, right, so using pink, you could have separate functions using separate overlays separate PL bit streams that get, lo that get dynamically loaded to the device. So here's an, an example of doing image processing. Here we've got our Zinc, Zinc MPSOC device. We've got X11 running, of course, for our windowed GUI environment, because we've probably got an Ultra. We've got our Ultra 96 board with a mini display port attached to it. So we've got a windowed environment we can use. Obviously, you can have USB for mouse and keyboard. And it's not shown there, but you probably have Ethernet or Wi-Fi connection as well. We add in our overlay with our different callable blocks within that overlay for doing image processing, HDMI in and out for the uh, image sensor or whatever our source is, and then displaying it out to somewhere else. And all of these are callable blocks within the overlay that we can call from Python. So that was, um, and this is sort of the setup we used when experimenting with Python and notebooks. 
of course, you've got to have your Ultra 96 V2 board. Ultra, Ultra 96 board doesn't have to be V2. It can be V1. Um, you want to need to download your SD card image and copy, burn it onto an SD card. And, when you, and you can find that at that link. And if you've, how many people have an Ultra 96 board already? <laughs> a few. So there's two variants. Start off with a V1 board. There's also now a V2 board. And, but right now, if you were to go buy one, you would get a V2 board but you would want to make sure that you download the right image there because the V1 image is not compatible with the V2 and vice versa. So you, you need to hook up all the hardware. Of course, you're going to, your power supply, um, you're going to need internet connection. You've got a few choices there for an internet connection. We found it easiest to use uh, a USB to Ethernet dongle, right, and then hook up wired Ethernet to a router um, that's very straightforward. Uh, you can also use Wi-Fi or, get out of your way, or a USB gadget, right? Um, and also optional, although really handy, um, I never like using a board without it, is a terminal con connection for UART. So you always have access to the command line. So these brief steps are uh, outlined in this really good video that's, that was done by Graham Shelley and Xilinx. He's sort of the, uh, oh, he's like the father of pink and Xilinx, if you will, right? He's, he, he talked to anybody pink at Xilinx, it's going to be Graham. Well, first off, you boot the board, um, then you open your browser, to, if you're using the Wi-Fi connection, it's one address. If you're using the USB gadget, it's another address. And USB to Ethernet, your IP address will depend, depend on what your router assigns to it. You could also attach USB Ethernet directly to your development PC and assign a static IP, in which, of course, that would be completely up to you. Um, but if you need to find out the if you if you hook it up to your router and let DHCP serve an address, then you just need to go in if config and find out what address was assigned. So when you've got that, IP, when you've got your system hooked up, your, your internet connection, Wi-Fi connection, whatever it is, ready, um, active, then you navigate to the IP address of the board, and this is what you see, right? This is the GUI that's presented to you. And we start by clicking on Getting Started. And that opens up another page of different notebooks that are all kind of like introductory, beginner level um, Jupyter notebooks that we can use. And we'll start with going into the Jupyter notebooks notebook. And here are a bunch of overlays that are available for you to use, to download and use directly on the board, right? Uh, the Hello World, and, yeah, and most of them are on Xilinx GitHub, and you find them by sorting by language by Jupyter Notebook, and that will get you to the notebooks you can choose from. Like I said, there's lots of them there you can pick from. Um, the Hello World is a pretty popular place to start, obviously, because it's Hello World. Uh, but today, we're most interested in the binarized neur neural network notebook. So what is a neural network? Um, modeled after, like, nerve cells in the brain that are called neurons, right? So think of uh, this is a, a picture of a nerve cell in the brain where you've got inputs and weights that are the synapses and the um, dendrils. And those get uh, summa you know, sum summation um, happens on those, on those inputs. And if those inputs reach a certain level, a threshold, then activation occurs and uh, fires an output signal off to um, the next set of neurons, right? So it, reaches a level where it uh, crosses the hillock 
moves along the axon to the next set of neurons for the next action to occur. And this is all uh, kind of outlined and described in much greater detail at this uh, link right here. So electrically, well, from an, our perspective, engineers and neural networks need to think of a neural network a little bit differently where we still have our inputs, right, and our weights, and the summation still occurs. And if we reach a certain threshold, then activation happens, like a, a match has happened in whatever we're evaluating, and we get a, an output signal. So in this, this is actually, this diagram is actually called the perceptron, but we can credit Rosenblatt from back in 1962 that came up with this, um, this sort of model of what a, what a neural network looks like. So we need to install our, our neural network notebook into Pink. And it's really as simple as running pip, uh, pip install command. If you're familiar with Python at all, then pip install is something that, you, that happens often because that's the glory of Python. Um, a lot of common popular commands, and this is one of them, that make it really easy to... Uh, extend the capabilities of the Python that's running on the system or um, add anything you need to add. So when we do that, we get another set of folders for our notebook. And we're most interested in, um, so there's the binary neural network, there's a quantized neural network, of course, getting started. Um, pink for... Uh, a sensors mezzanine that is that um, mezzanine card that can run uh, attached to the Ultra 96 board, but we're most interested in today the binary the binarized neural network. And even then, there's a bunch of different BNNs we can choose from. Uh, but uh, our simple example today is we're just going to look at road signs, right? So this is a binarized neural network on pink. It does image recognition um, with a binary with a BNN uh, inspired. Well, inspired by the VGG16 model. Um, it has six convolutional layers, three max pool layers, and three fully connected layers to it. And there's a whole bunch more information at this link for it as well. And uh, for those of you that know Saraj, or, or Saha, I'm sorry, Sahaj, uh, Sarup at Lenaro, he did a really good video on using this exact BNN with the Ultra 96 in pink. So the first step using the BNN, we needed to instantiate the classifier. Um, this automatically, so this is, if any, has anybody used a, a Jupyter Notebook before? A few people? Okay, so when a Jupyter Notebook, for those that haven't seen this before, when a Jupyter Notebook runs on, let's say, the Ultra 96 board, um, it, run, it looks, it, it's kind of like self-documented. It runs within a web browser. It displays a description of what you're going to do, and then presents a window of commands and such that are going to run. And there's a button at the top of the browser, which we don't show here, that's a play button that actually plays, that performs these steps, these Python steps, to do what's described, right? So we're creating a classifier that's going to automatically download the bitstream on the onto the device and load the weights that, uh, that are trained on the specified data set, right? Then we're going to list the available classes. And these are the, think of the classes as the types of, um, we're looking at road signs. So these are the types of road signs that we are 
going to be evaluating or um, te- no, comparing against. And then we uh, load the images that we plan to um, evaluate, right? If one's a stop sign, one's a, a pedestrian walking sign, and one is a, I can't even read that one. I think it's a no cars sign. So anyway, uh, hit, the, hit the play button to run these Python steps and And in doing so, we see right here, this is the, the BNN running in hardware. So this is the, the neural network running on the PL. And we see that it took, it processed nearly 3,300 3, images in one second. Right? But pretty fast. Now, we compare the, the BNN running purely in software. PL is not being used and it processed less than two images per second. So right away we see that uh, running it in the PL, we were able to run that BNN at 1,850 times faster, quite a bit faster. Yes? So this uh, network is already, basically what you're doing is with the, uh, the BNN that you loaded, that is already processed data. So it's basically, it's already weighted data. Correct. Okay. That's my understanding, yes. The the data has already been weighted. So an example of, we toss in it, we we present this image as input to the BNN. Right, we know it's a stop sign. Is the neural network going to know it's a stop sign? And the neural network... Um, evaluates the image, breaks it up into tiles, right, and then comes up with the result that yes, it is a stop sign. Pretty simple example, but it works. So, how can you get? So, we've got a running neural network. Now we we want to do some fun um, experimentation. Uh, we want to come up with a neural network of our own or go see what else is out there in the world. Uh, it's important to think and remember that pink experience, Python experience, isn't really necessarily required. You don't have to know anything about pink to get started with it, right? Um, Xilinx design experience is not required. You just Because you can simply download that SD card image burn it onto an SD card using Etcher or Win32 Disk Imager or whatever your favorite tool is, um, and then boot the board with it immediately, right? But you do need an Ultra 96 board. In this case, you need an Ultra 96 board and an internet connection. And you can learn more about Pink at that link. And I'm not sure if there's any more bullets on here or not. Oh, yes. Get, get the Ultra 96 image at this link, and there's a lot more information there about um, overlays. You can watch the uh, getting started guide, or getting started video on YouTube. And I think this is the same link to the Sahaj, um, his video. And then Pick a neural network, a different neural network, and run it on pink yourself. Um, Fun little fun fact. This course was developed thinking that this session was a 50-minute session and discovered last night that it's only a 20, 25-minute session. Um, So that meant I had to cut a bunch of slides out. And one of the and the slides I cut out were all about using the QNN, the quantized neural network. So if you want to go and experiment, you've got an Ultra 96 board. That would be a, a great one to, to play with as well. Uh, and if if we have extra time, I don't know what time it is. Okay. So I can go through the, the index, the appendix, and I can show you what the QNN looks like as well. So deeper dive learning, 
Avnet provides a lot of uh, technical training courses from beginner level, getting started with um, Zinkem PSSC, hardware and software, and Petal Linux, and advanced courses for uh, SDSOC development, uh, AI and ML development, and Python development as well. The Python is a, is a two-day course. Pink is a two-day course. And the pink folks at Xilinx also created this free book. You can um, download for free, or you can buy a hard copy on Amazon. So this is a, it's a pretty substantial book. It, you know, it would take you more than one night to read it. But it is, it is a really good reference. I would recommend downloading it for free. Um, it is, it's, it's a good reference. And that's it for session. If I have more time, if you don't have anywhere else to be, I can take a look at what the QNN looks like. So QNN is a quantized neural network on pink. Um, and this one extracts image labels from the data set. So in classifies the image chosen by the user, okay? Uh, so this is different than a BNN. This is what a quantized neural network looks like. We've got your uh, inputs and your weights, and they've, they've, they flow from one to the next to the next. Right, and this is what happens in the PS, image input, user interface, all occurs in the PS, what's happening in the PS. The computation and the neural network all occurs in the PL, and the outputs all occur in the, in the PS. So here's an example of taking this image and running it through the QNN. Again, it's a, it's a Jupyter Notebook. Right? So we run these steps to execute the first convolutional layer uh, in Python. And we see that it took oh, a little more than a second. And we off uh, offload that to hardware and see that it took quite a bit less time. And... The fully connected layers are executed in the Python backend, and then the classification is finalized. So here's our classification results, where the QNN recognized that, hey, that must be a great white shark. It's correct. It's a great white shark. Right? And it also gives us some alternate possibilities of what it thinks it might be, like a tiger shark, a hammerhead even a sturgeon or a stingray. They're obviously false, but the network thinks that there's other possibilities, and those are a few of them. So this, this image is pretty busy. There's a lot going on between, with other fish in the picture and shading on the, on the shark itself. So let's take it a, a second look, give it, feed it a second image, a different image, and see if it still comes up with the same result. Right? So here's a different image of a shark. And this time, it actually recognized it as it's, it is indeed a tiger shark. So we kind of we thought we were going to trick it. Maybe it would still think it's a great white. No, it's still smart enough to realize it's a tiger shark and not a great white. But again, still came up with alternatives like hammerhead and stingray. So my colleague is a hunter, um, and he goes deer hunting every year with his sons, and. Just for fun, he thought he'd try out this image as well of, of a uh, buck and fed this image into the network and came back, what, wait, ha no, it is not a water buffalo, definitely not a ram or a gazelle, it's a deer. So what went wrong with the network that it thinks that it, it didn't come up with the correct result? And it turns out that uh, the classification list for this network didn't include deer for one reason, for some unknown reason. 
lots of other animals clearly listed. For some reason, not deer. So that's why. Uh, and those those classes, you can take a look at what is the, um, in those classes at these web links here, and you will see that list, that very long list of animals. And there was no deer in the list. But if, if it had identified it correctly, it would have identified it as a mule deer. Very common to the uh, woods of Utah. And that's all I have. So questions, yes. Um, so going back to the overlays, and you'd mentioned that they're loaded dynamically, but in fact they're part of the bitstream. So you would load these up front before you're actually doing your processing. Yes, um, and, the, and the notebook takes care of reconfiguring the PL as needed. So you could go from one notebook to another, and the PL will be reconfigured. Oh, so with that's that what you meant by dynamically reconfiguring. Right. The actual notebook understands what overlays that it needs, so it loads the appropriate uh, bitstream for you. That's correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of uh, infrastructure under the covers of that notebook, yep. um, and quite a bit of development um, way ahead of time, right, by the pink developers to create those bit streams that match that notebook. Yeah, I know there's a lot of work there. Yeah. So, um, quite a bit of work being done to make it easy to use, right? So, the, yeah, the pink, the pink folks at Xilinx get a lot of credit for a lot of work that goes in there. But it also could be, it's not something so difficult or secret that Customers, you guys couldn't extend yourselves. You could create your own notebooks, your own overlays. Um, it's not hard. It's not really hard to do. Um, it can be done. In fact, those overlays use uh, microblazes in the PL. Believe it or not, in a lot of cases. Are there templates for the overlays? Uh, that's a good question. Then that I've seen. That that would be a good question. I'll. I'll ask. I, I could find, try and find out. Like a, a standard way to create one? Yeah. Not that I've seen, but that might be something that, we, that is, that's probably something that's discussed in the, uh, the pink course that we created. Yeah. Anybody else? Great. Yes. Um, my, yeah, just grab the microphone on the chair. That way you're recorded for posterity. Okay. So can you go back to the timing of the PL versus the PS for the quantized QN? For the QN, you have two numbers, like uh, how many milliseconds? So that's one. Right, like right here? Okay, that's, yeah, it's 103. That's for the... Uh, this is the QNN, so this is first layer, okay. a little more than a second versus 2.2. Okay, 2.2. Okay, okay. Well, 2,200, 22,000 22 milliseconds. Okay. Microseconds. So so that's for the uh, PL part, right? Right. And and for the following PS is 103. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Uh, what's the frequency of the PS versus the PL? The the processor. So the processor runs in the Zinc MPSC. Is it a gigahertz, Josh, or one point? I don't two? know. I'm asking. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, much faster than the PL, actually. Okay. The PL. Oh, that XE interconnect is. Probably 100 megahertz, 100, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head for this particular, because it's configurable. Okay. So for this design, I don't know what that Axie interconnect was configured to be, to run at. Um, the fabric of the PL uh, can run many hundreds of megahertz. Okay. So depending on logic design in the PL, dictates kind of how fast the PL can run. Okay, thanks. Right. How, how well it's designed and how synchronous it is. The one thing you got to look at is in the hardware, in the fabric, it's all parallel, right? So you've got parallel paths, so it's a lot faster. It's not I'm serial. I'm just curious why the yeah. last three, uh, I mean, except softmax, but for the, um, the last three fully connected layer, why not running in the fabric instead of running on the, on the, on the software side? Uh, if you go back to your partition graph, right, uh, it's fully connected. I mean, given a network, you know the size of each layer. You can just also do that in the, you know. Can you go back? Yeah, keep going back. Oh, right. Yeah, that one, yeah. yeah. So next one, yeah. 
So yeah. allow running this fully clean layer in the fabric as well. I mean, that's totally parallel. Right, I don't know. OK. For some reason. <laughs> yeah. Just curious. Yeah. I think maybe it's not. I think maybe the PL is not big enough to contain all the logic. That could be. This is a ZU3 device, so it's not really big. Yeah. Um, that could be one reason. Yeah, because the fully connected layer basically just the BNN that you have before, right? So it's just like a CNN tacked on to a BMM, BNN for a little bit. So you you do have a PL implementations for both of, both types of logic. Right. But maybe you cannot fit them both in at the same time. That could be. Well, the other thing too is, if you look to what they're doing, they're actually using Max. They're using multiply accumulators, so they're multiplying by the weights, and then they're, you're doing summations in the uh, conversion in the Max pool, and that's basically where you get your gains in speed in the uh, fabric. The fully connected there is the same thing; it's just dot products, right? Yeah. 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 There's lots of DSP blocks and. Max in the in the PL that are no that make FPGA so great for signal processing. Anybody else? Great. Thank you very much.